Thank you for our team that leads worship week by week. Amen? Can you give them a hand? I mean, our, our worship <laughs> musicians. We're grateful for you. We love you. Thank you for leading us in worship and the word. We pray the word. We read the word. We sing the word. Now we study the word together. So we do each week. It's the scriptures, the scriptures, the scriptures. And so we pray that God would give us a heart to hear his words above our own. Amen? I mean, we inhabit a culture. We inhabit a culture that's filled with voices, loud, impressive voices, persistent, persuasive voices, all of them vying for our attention, pressing us to listen and to believe what they're saying. And our ears are constantly bombarded with a jumble of competing voices, huh? Competing for our hearts. Competing with each other to be heard, but also competing for our hearts and competing for our minds with narratives that are carefully crafted to convince us Messages that have been market tested for maximum impact on us. Truth claims that have been expertly formulated to excite our emotions and to gain our trust. But end up darkening our minds and betraying our lives of any real good. That's been the story of the world from ancient times. And that's never going to change until the way, the truth, and the life himself returns in all of his truth-revealing light and glory to establish the world in God-reality, in real righteousness, in felt peace, in An eternal world permeated by God's own unshakable truth. Where every molecule is lined up with God's truth. See, in the midst of all the noise bombarding our eyes and ears, God wants us to know that He has something to say. In the middle of all that noise. And if we listen to Him... We'll finally hear some truth we can trust. And if we will listen to him, he promises we'll never regret it. We'll never regret it. So in Isaiah 51, God gives us three incentives for listening to him attentively, expectantly, leaning forward, listening close open-heartedly, three incentives, three really reassurances to have full-hearted trust in knowing that his promises are true and that he's using all of his considerable power to work for your good and mine. He wants us to be assured of that. So look, if you would, Isaiah 51, verse 1, let's read the first three verses. God says this several times. He begins Three times this way. First time, listen to me, you who pursue righteousness. Is that you? He's talking to you. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you are hewn. He's using a metaphor here. He's saying, saying, look back. Speaking to Israel in particular here, so he's going to use an an example uh, that they're going to identify with, but we can get in on this pretty easily if we'll pay attention here. He says, look to the rock from which you were hewn, the quarry from which you were dug, where you came from. Verse 2, look to Abraham, your forefather, and to Sarah who bore you. Now, what about them? God's going to point out what it is he wants us to pay attention to here. For he was but one man when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. 
In the same way, the Lord comforts Zion. These are all of Abraham's multiplied offspring. The Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden. Her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and the voice of song. So here's the point. Here's what God's saying. That if God God can bless, if God can touch... Barren and childless old bodies that belong to Abraham and Sarah. If God can take one solitary couple and create out of that hopeless and helpless beginning, out of that bring an innumerable multitude of descendants to bless the whole world, well then why can't God do something new with you and me? If we trust God like childless Abraham and Sarah did and not trust in our own adequacy, Abraham and Sarah knew they had none. They'd gone almost a century trying to have babies and couldn't have babies. If we trust God like they did and not our own adequacy, when we open-heartedly trust the adequacy of God, like Abraham did with his need, then even in all our need and in all of our weakness and in all of our inadequacy, we, by trusting God, get in on what God did for Abraham. That's the message here. We get in on what God did for Abraham. And what God did for Abraham was not an anomaly. That's the point of the texture. That's the point of what God's saying. What I did for Abraham was not an anomaly. It was a pattern for everyone who listens and trusts God like Abraham did. With simple trust. Simple trust. Childlike trust. Because, see, God can make, he said it about himself here, God can make barren wastelands, the barren wastelands of our lives, he can make them into a flourishing garden. What a description of our lives. That God can renew us like Eden. That's a picture. That God, to borrow a phrase, that God can shape a Genesis week out of the chaos of our lives. God can do that. And he says, when I do that, he he says that the text there, God spreads joy and God spreads gladness. Yeah, if your life flourishes like Eden out of the barren wastelands of your life that you've made of it of sin and and not trusting God, if you walk into and participate in what God is doing, he brings Eden-like flourishing, spreads joy, spreads gladness, creates thankful voices out of your moans and groans, turns sorrow into singing, mourning into dancing, exuberant songs of praise, And we do that because of the transforming work he does in our lives from the inside out. See, that's what we've been hopefully doing for the last little while this morning. Singing to the Lord out of the abundance of what he's done for us. We're responding to his work in our lives. Amen? God spreads the joy. So, why listen to God? First of all, because he's the God who has the ability to bless us by making our barren and burdened lives to flourish from the inside out. That's why we should listen to him. He can do what no one else can do. You see, you won't find that kind of power on TikTok, huh? You won't find that kind of power in the stock market. To take your barren and burdened life and make it flourish like Eden. With joy and gladness and peace. The world's hunting for that. They're they're investing in that. Everything they've got. 
You only find that kind of life-changing from the inside-out power in Christ alone. That's the reason we should listen to God. Here's a second reassuring incentive to listen to God. Verse 4. God says it again. Pay attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation. For a law will go out from me. And I will set my justice, my setting things right, my decisions. They will be a light to the peoples, the nations. My righteousness draws near. My salvation has gone out and my, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands, they hope for me and for my arm they wait. So lift up your eyes to the heavens. Go ahead, look up to the sky, look up to the heavens, and look down then to the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish like smoke, and the earth will wear out like a garment. And everybody who dwells in it is going to die in like manner, going to drop like flies, is the actual Hebrew expression here. But my salvation, unlike everything you see above you and under your feet and you yourself, unlike any of that, my salvation will be forever. And my righteousness, my setting things right in the world, setting things right in your lives, my righteousness will never be dismayed. It will never be dismantled. None of us likes the way the world is right now. Amen to that? Well, neither does God. The difference is, He can change it. And He's actually doing it right now. If you have eyes to see it, He's doing it right now. So how is He doing it? How does God change the world? And how's he doing it right now? Well, it's, you, he uses a very surprising method. It's, ne- it's usually not the method we go to first. But it's the method God's been using, is using, and will use until it's all transformed. He's changing the world with revelation. And I don't mean the book of Revelation only, but the entire revelation of the message of Scripture. That's what God is using to change the world. God is right now, at this very moment, changing the world. You know how He's doing it? He's doing it through the message of the good news message of the gospel, and He's doing it one life at a time. One changed life at a time. 